The African American Leadership Summit presents Illuminations. Welcome to this week's edition of Illuminations. My name is Stephen Davis, and I'm the president of the African American Leadership Summit. And today we're going to talk about a very special topic, at least for me it's special. We're going to talk about Wall Street. And we have as our guest today someone who's been with us before, who happens to be the president of a Wall Street firm entitled Magna Securities, Patricia Winnens. Welcome to the show this week. Thank you for having me. Okay. Part of what we're going to talk about um, is how the black community need to be involved in the operation of Wall Street. But the first question I wanted to start off by asking you is, you hear so much about Wall Street, Wall Street, Wall Street. Just what is Wall Street? <laughs> well, actually, Wall Street is an actual street. It's a street where companies came to buy and sell their stock in the uh, late 1800s. That street then developed into what is now uh, an exchange called the New York Stock Exchange. And um, the street where it is located is an actual district, a financial district. There are other financial districts across the country, which we also say belong to the Wall Street community. And uh, Wall Street in and of itself is an industry where brokerage firms um, work and asset managers and it is where um, state mu municipalities come to raise uh, money where they sell their bonds and it's where uh, a, c a company comes to uh, to do an IPO. Okay. Well, what, what, what's, well, first of all, what is an IPO? I was going to ask you first what is an asset manager, but you brought an IPO. <laughs> what's an IPO? Uh, an IPO is an initial public offering. Um, say, for example, that you own a company, and when you incorporate, you get a book, and in that book you have a certain number uh, of certificates of stock. That stock represents your ownership in the company. Should you decide to sell part of that stock to raise equity, in your company, um, y you are an, you are selling um, the initial stock that was issued to your company to the public. Mm -hmm. So we call it the initial public offering. You may decide down the road to uh, issue additional stock and sell that stock, but in that instance, that would be called a secondary issue. Okay. Now, in in your explanation, you had said uh, you had mentioned bonds, and you also talk about stocks. What's the difference between stocks and bonds for the layperson? Um, bonds are what we refer to as a fixed income instrument on Wall Street, simply because uh, what you get from a, a bond is a stated rate of interest. And most bonds, a typical bond, will pay you that interest um, twice a year. And the rate that is issued uh, on a particular bond remains constant throughout the duration of that bond. All bonds do have a uh, what we call the coupon, which is the interest rate, and a stated maturity. Um, the interest is fixed. The principal, however, can go up and down depending on a given uh, interest rate climate. Um, stock does not have a maturity date per se. It is perpetual, and it, um, it it's also a certificate, and it it it's equity as opposed to debt. A bond would be considered debt. A stock would be considered equity. Um, Bonds are uh, can also be issued by corporations, as can a stock. If a company is selling stock, they are giving you equity. They don't have to pay you that back. At any, what what any is it meant by equity? That it means that you own. Part it's like of the having company? equity in your yeah in your house. Once you pay down your mortgage to a certain degree, the value of your house is still what you paid for it. Hopefully, you know if the real estate market hasn't gone uh, against you. But it's, it's like having um, some intrinsic value, some value in a company. It gives you ownership. Okay. Now, um, when you're talking about stocks and bonds in Wall Street, I mean, people here, um, especially when you do the nightly news, is always the New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange. They're talking about NASDAQ. Um, what are the differences between the New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, and NASDAQ? And what does NASDAQ mean? Okay, well, getting back to the, uh, the NYSE, which we call the New York Stock Exchange, it is an actual exchange where uh, the largest of the public companies are traded. And, and at the New York Stock Exchange, there are, are different positions around the New York Stock Exchange floor where the company uh, is bid for and asked for. So if, if you were an investor and you wanted to buy a particular stock and it was a, a larger company, 
um, then perhaps that stock would be traded on that exchange. The American exchange um, is different in that um, it, it's also a floor with all these different trading pits, but instead of using open outcry as they do on the New York Stock Exchange, they use hand signals. Um, each time that someone wants to buy a stock and uh, it belongs to the American Stock Exchange, the floor broker would still go over to the area where that stock is traded, but instead of yelling and screaming, he would use hand signals to tell the specialist on the floor whether he's buying or selling a stock. And, and I don't profess to know all those hand signals. That's not <laughs> what I do on a daily basis. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the over-the-counter market, um, which is also known as the NASDAQ, is an electronic market where uh, the symbols are also different. If you have a company that trades on the OTC, uh, it would generally have a stock symbol with four characters as opposed to two characters or three characters as would the stocks that trade on the American and the NYSE. Um, now, before you go further, what, what is OTC? I'm getting all well, these acronyms OT, OTC and <laughs> jargons. It just simply means over-the-counter. Uh -huh. And um, over-the-counter should also be used interchangeably with NASDAQ. NASDAQ is the name of the electronic system that the traders use to execute orders that are over the counter, so to speak, there, there, because there is no exchange, there is no floor. So it's, it's you know, basically a trader sitting at his desk uh, executing an order based on what he sees on, the, on an electronic screen. On that screen, uh, it will tell you what the bid is, what the ask is, how many shares are offered on the bid side, I mean, offered on the offer side, asked for on, on the bid side, and so forth and so on. Now, I'm a person, I've been looking through the newspapers or I've been hearing about some company and I decide I want to buy stock. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Do I go to the New York Stock Exchange? And no, you should call a broker. Um, if, you, if you look at some of the uh, financial network channels that are out there, um, you will see any number of brokerage firms that are advertising. Um, you go to a broker, you tell them what stock you'd like to buy, they'll tell you what the requirements are in order for you to trade with them. They could require you to have the monies already available on deposit with a clearing firm before they would execute a transaction. Um, some brokerage firms will give you research about companies, other brokerage firms won't. You, you sort of have to, uh, uh, and, then, and then there are also publications of a number of different firms that are available. But you sort of have to know what you want to do, what type of instrument you want to buy, because not every brokerage firm sells all types of uh, instruments. For example, at my firm, we only deal with stock. We don't deal with bonds. Um, our customer is typically an institutional customer as opposed to an individual. But so what is meant by institutional customer? Uh, institutional meaning uh, public pension funds, private pension funds, um, asset managers. And by asset manager, <laughs> managers, which is a question you were going to ask uh, earlier, these are professional people who are, who are paid a fee to buy and sell stock on behalf of public pension plans or endowment funds, hospital funds, um, private corporate pension plans, and in any, any number of pools of money that exist. So in, in essence, what you're telling me when you say, especially when you talk about pension plans, is that there are a lot of people that are in the stock market who don't necessarily know that they are. They just take their monies it doesn't come to them. They're just looking at, at age 55 or 60, 65, whatever, when it's time for the, their pension to come in, that the money's there, that they will be paid. But in essence, they're in the stock market. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Um, the pension plan market represents what is a $4 trillion market. And uh, as such, the people who are managing these funds have to have a vehicle by which to invest it. Some of it will go into bonds, which are the fixed income stated rates of interest that are available to them, and another portion of it will go into stock. Um, according to statistics um, from 1918 to, uh, I guess, what was, uh, well, actually from 1914 to 1988, there was a, a survey that was done, or somebody did a study, and they found that uh, the stock had outperformed both the bond market and the real estate market. So if, a, if a, uh, a pension fund is trying to figure out how they are going to keep track or stay not only above inflation, but be able to 
uh, have these pension fund dollars available in future years as these people are retiring and want to get those benefits, um, they need to be invested in the stock market. And it's, it's, I would say the majority of the money in the stock market is probably um, pension fund money and mutual fund money. And mutual funds are, are more representative of individuals who are buying into a lot of the, the big mutual funds. Okay. What, what makes an asset manager, what, what are some of the determinations that he decides when he's looking over uh, the different stocks to buy? What, what, what are some of the things that, that, that that person looks for? Well, generally they have what's called uh, an investment style, and that style can range from uh, investing in large cap uh, companies to small cap companies, value companies, growth companies. But uh, to answer that question, I guess, uh, in a different way, the decisions that they would make when they decide to buy a particular stock have to do with analysis. It could be technical analysis or fundamental analysis. Um, if they're looking at a stock from a fundamental point of view, they want to look at different ratios that tell them how the stock has, how the, how the company has performed. Uh, they're going to look at what, what the P.E. ratio is, what the liquidity ratio is. They're going to look at the company's debt. Uh, they're going to look at the company's management. Okay, now um, what, what is P.E.? <laughs> there again, we go with jargon. Um, PE is price earnings. Okay. Uh, typically, a stock will trade um, so many times earnings. So let's say that a company is producing um, one dollar uh, a year, one dollar a year in earnings. That mean, meaning one dollar, uh, meaning that every stock that is outstanding is entitled to one dollars of earnings from that company. Um, given the industry that it's in, typically it would trade uh, so many times earnings. So let's say the stock was trading at $15, then the P-E ratio would be 15 because it's 15 times earnings. And if you looked at other stocks within that industry, you would get um, a very quick assessment as to whether or not that stock is over or undervalued. But you'd still have to look at all the underlying fundamentals. Uh, of that company just because it's undervalued doesn't mean that it's a good buy. It could be undervalued because there's not much demand for it. And if there's not much demand for it um, and it's a bad company, certainly you want to stay away from it. But if there's not much demand for it and all the fundamentals are really, really good, then you could make the assessment that at some point in the future that stock will go up and come more in line with the average of the other stocks that are trading within that industry. Now, we have a, a, a probably a, a mental mindset of a lot of people who weighing stocks and bonds in banks, taking their money and putting it in a bank or putting it under their mattress. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but say in terms of banks, banks give you a fixed rate of interest. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might go up or down, but you know that you're going to get a certain rate of interest, but more importantly, that your money is guaranteed up to $100,000, that you're That's not correct. going to lose out um, in terms of money unless the federal government goes out and sometimes mm -hmm. that sometimes it's the way that the politics are going these days they make it seem like the, the government can go out of business tomorrow yeah. um, mm -hmm. but anyway as be that as it may that um, why would I as a person think of investing in stocks and bonds which uh, if I'm right stocks have no guarantee you have no guarantee that you're not gonna put your money in and lose it that's correct. Why would I think of putting monies in the stock market as opposed to a bank, where I know at least up to, up to $100,000 that my money's guaranteed? Well, I think it has to do with a very uh, simple economic premise, and that is one of risk versus reward. Um, when, you, when you put your money in a bank, you're really not taking uh, a whole lot of risk because you know that up to $100,000, you can always get those monies back. Um, if you decide to go into the stock market, you can you have to assess what that risk is, and there are ways to quantify and calculate that risk based on, as I said, doing um, some analysis. But if you if you would like to earn more than what you are currently getting in the bank, then you have to look elsewhere. And there are some good companies. For example, um, the S and P 500 last year um, returned uh, just under 40 percent. Okay. Now versus before you go any further, you said S and P. What does S&P mean? It's just, uh, it stands for Standard & Poor. It's an index that took 500 stocks and calculated where 
um, the average return were on those 500 stocks. Okay. So, um, and these would have these would be mostly, um, you know, uh, m some of the larger companies that are trading in the in the marketplace. Now, um, you hear all the time that the Dow Jones is going up to 3,000 and it was 4,000, and has it broke 5,000 yet? Yes, it has. Okay, <laughs> broke 5,000. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for the for the average person if they are deciding to get into the stock market? Uh, what it typically means is that on, on the majority of the stocks are going up. And we've had, uh, as of as of They're uh, up today, in value? Yes. Okay. The majority, of, in, in other words, the price of the stock has continued to climb. And when you took the average, it was up by so many points on the day. Um, yesterday, they had another record high where the market went up 70 points and closed above 50, the, the 5,300 mark. Um, we started the beginning of the year with a lot of resistance just um, around, or actually toward the end of last year, beginning of this year, uh, with a lot of resistance at the 5,000 level. So if, if your money is in the stock market, um, it's not to say that every stock is going up, but there are more winners than losers. Okay. Now, conventional wisdom is saying, especially in this political climate of balancing the budget, balancing the budget, balancing the budget, mm -hmm. that um, if you don't, financial catastrophe is going to happen. But while we say that the stock market is continuing to go up, from your opinion, how important is it to balance the federal budget as opposed to what the stock market performance? Well, um, interest rates, you have to understand that balancing the budget has to do with the amount of debt that the government is issuing. Because they don't have enough money to pay for all the programs that they would like to, to pay for, they go out and they issue bonds and those bonds are guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. So as the government issues more and more debt, they have to pay back more and more interest. And any time you have an oversupply of something, um, you know, the interest rate could go up because you have to find more buyers um, to, to absorb the quantity that's coming into the marketplace. Um, so as if, if interest rates go up, it's not good for companies because a lot of companies finance their inventories through credit lines and if the Federal Reserve raises the the discount rate then Fed funds rates are going to go up and so are um, credit lending rates to companies and as uh, companies have to uh, see more of their profit go to pay interest on, on the funds that they borrow from the bank then they have two choices either to have a lower profit or to pass that cost onto the consumer, which could be inflationary. But let's say that they do uh, absorb the cost of that interest, then their earnings are going to be less. And as I said earlier in the program, uh, a stock price is going to trade based on earnings. So if the earnings are going to go down, the stock price is going to go down. Okay. So in, in essence, if I'm listening to you correctly, when the stock price goes down, then that affects the people who have bought stock, mm -hmm. who then have rumblings to the management in terms of getting rid of them. Mm -hmm. So that um, um, I guess that is one of the things that's fueling the downsizing, is mm -hmm. that when you don't have the ability to increase markets, then you have to at least artificially make your profit earnings grow up, go up, so that you get rid of people to cut costs. Is that a fair well, assessment? Yeah, well. There are a number of ways um, that companies uh, have downsized. Uh, the most unpopular way is obviously to, uh, to cut jobs. Um, but due to technology advances, uh, there are a lot of jobs that are being replaced with technology, um, which allows someone to, to take what they would have paid um, in salaries on their payroll and add that directly to the bottom line without compromising the service that they provide um, to their customers. But, but, but all these roads ultimately do lead back to Washington and, and balancing the budget. Okay. Now, let, let's change gears just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, a company that decides it, that it's looking for monies and decides that it needs to get into the capital market via Wall Street, mm -hmm. um, how does, uh, just uh, not in 
intricate details because I know we can have a whole other show on <laughs> the details of doing it. But just on a sketch, how does this company go about getting into that capital market? Well, um, I would say they, they probably, if they're, well, it depends on what they're looking to do. If they're looking to take their company public, then they should first have um, a, a business plan that would talk about what they would do with the company after they sold shares um, and received the money from those shares, um, how they would expand the company and how they would make that company more profitable. But you really should have an overall business plan that talks about the management of the company and why you're, you're good at being able to run the company, um, how additional financing is going to cause the company to expand and be more profitable, and you know, how you intend to uh, increase your market share. It's a, it, an array of, of things that a venture capitalist firm on Wall Street may want to know. Um, okay. Now, when you say go public, that means what does that mean? Well, uh, a, lot of, a lot of ways that a company that has already been existing and has their business up and running, a lot of ways that they're able to uh, get additional funding. Let's say that they don't want to um, burden the company with debt because it would be very easy in, in some instances for them to go to their banker um, and make a loan, although certain companies have had a problem doing that. Let's say they go to Wall Street and they want to sell the initial shares of stock that came with the company that they own. Um, they have to do more than just go there and say, I want to sell the stock. They've, they, they've got to go through SEC approval. The Securities and, and Exchange Commission. Securities and Exchange Commission and um, do a registration and in order to actually uh, authorize more shares or sell existing shares that the company already has. Then, from your perspective, sitting on Wall Street, do you see a lot of black-owned firms that enter the IPO and the capital market? Well, I don't uh, necessarily see that, but again, that's not the line of business that I'm in. Um, I imagine it, it happens, um, but I think there probably needs to be more of an educational process for black entrepreneurs who are interested in doing that. I, I, I think that maybe they're not aware of what the process is, they're not aware of what the capital requirements are to be able to sell their stock on specific exchanges. Um, there's a lot that they need to, to do to, to prep their companies, um, to put their companies in a position to do that. I mean, it wouldn't be good, <coughs> excuse me, if a company is losing um, a lot of money to want to come to Wall Street because people on Wall Street want to see companies that have been very profitable so that their stock goes up. Um, not to say that that doesn't happen, but um, they should begin the process of at least talking to people on Wall Street about what is required and, um, you know, look, look in terms of, um, you know, two to three years out in planning, now, now, in the planning do, stage. Do, is the reason why the technology stocks have done so well is because they had something that people could tangibly see and it's like a new product and that people are willing to take chances on it as opposed to say service companies um, or is there well the technology stocks did well probably up until um, well somewhere around mid-December there became uh, a decline in the technology stocks which was led by uh, a company known as Micron, but um, they were producers of chips. And um, when Microsoft came out with their new product, Win95, um, that spurred a whole new demand for the production of microchips. And uh, the chips that were required for this new product uh, were not able to be built as quickly as they needed to be. Uh, for all the people who wanted to buy into the Win95 product. But uh, yeah, it's, it's speed, 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 um, better, better software programs that require uh, a lot more speed in terms of the computations that are required by these programs. And um, it's, it's, it's a growing process. We've grown, you know, in the last five years in terms of the technology that's available to enable us to do a lot more with just what we have at our fingertips on the computer um, and you know getting into this whole internet business 
You know, there are programs in many cases that you need uh, to download certain types of things from, from the Internet, for example, uh, pictures. Okay. So but, it, but it seems to me that in all of that you're saying, that in terms of the communities, whether black or white, but in particular talking to the black community, that they need to get more involved in um, stock purchasing, uh, bond purchasing, um, um, that they're not doing as much as they, they need to be doing as a community. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yeah, uh, particularly if they don't, if they're not involved in some other type of retirement program. Um, many, um, you know, African Americans who do work in government jobs have those retirement programs. Not to say that they couldn't do some investing on their own, um, but if you don't, you need to take a lot of things into consideration. You know, and how are you going to finance your retirement? How are you going to pay for a college education? Um, I think you first need to look at. Uh, your overall situation, pay down your debt um, after you've bought a house and car uh, and you have some disposable income rather than you know doing something with it, save it. And if you're young enough that you can afford to take a little bit more risk than what you would receive in a bank, then you should look to some of these markets. Okay, we've been with Pat Winnens, president of Magna Securities. I'd like to thank her for being with us today. I'd like to thank her to this extent, that the African American Leadership Summit have decided that Wall Street is one of the most important facets that we need to know about on an ongoing basis. And I'm happy to say that Pat Winnens will host a show that the African American Leadership Summit will be producing in early spring, right here on the station, that deals with Wall Street and investing. And we look for you to look for it. And we will be telling you about it in the coming weeks. In the meantime, thank you so much for being with us, Pat. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. And tune in with us next week for another wonderful topic here on Illuminations. Thank you so much.